welcome to our Lemony Salon number eight. So first I want to introduce Alan Lundell. And we are here. He, Alan is like my oldest friend in California where we live. And we're at his and his wife, son Lundell's uh, beach house in beautiful Aptos, right on right on the beach, right on the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, I'll, I'll move the camera around so you can check it out. Yeah. We have the wallpaper on. Aptos Beach, Cal, Northern California, near Santa Cruz. It's been a glorious day. It's it's fairly, it can be chilly here in the summer. So all you tourists come from Michigan and Norway and they're shocked to find that the beaches of this part of California can be really cold. Today was 60s into 70s. Uh, the marine layer of fog will come rolling in and blanket the bay uh, in this cool. And this very marine layer gives us some of the best wine grapes in the world and the best agriculture. Because it's, it sort of soothes the landscape and keeps it moist. Yeah, so it's a beautiful planet we're on. Uh, a planet that, unlike Mars, still has liquid water at the surface. And this miracle of what Alan's showing is an an ocean, a planetary ocean, which was maintained for three billion years. That's gone off. Three billion years. Uh, so this planetary ocean is a miracle of the cosmos because planets don't hold liquid water easily on their surfaces. So in, in most exosolar systems, we would see that as these planets age, they would lose this, this what's known as a volaton. And it often evaporates, uh, if, if the planet's too close to the sun, like Venus, it evaporates into the atmosphere. And then the oxygen component uh, of the H2O is stripped away. And then the carbon in the atmosphere would join in uh, with it and create a carbon dioxide atmosphere which is the same thing that happened on Venus as on Mars. As Mars lost it, its oceans, it didn't lose it the way Venus lost it. So that was a, a beautiful little segue, little cameo of why we are here. The fact that our planet maintained a liquid ocean for 3 billion years, actually more than 3 billion years on its own, without any help from life or any feedback mechanism, we kept a liquid water, liquid water at the surface. We kept it going, or, or the planet did, by happenstance, which probably is very rare. So unlike a lot of sci-fi movies that go to alien lifeless worlds that show oceans, probably that's extremely unusual. So why did Earth maintain its liquid water? Well, we're still asking that question, trying to work it out. Was it because we have a huge oversized moon that somehow made the, the planet sort of a hydrostable environment for liquid water? Um, Mars lost it because Mars, if it had an electric, uh, a magnetic field, it had the dynamo to protect itself from the solar wind, which would come and deflect around Mars as it does with Earth, with our you know, Van Allen belts or our our protective layer, uh, but Mars didn't have that or it lost that sort of that magnetosphere. And so its atmosphere is also stripped away. So as Mars dried down, and uh, our special guest, Alex Longo, will say more about that. But as Mars dried down, it started to lose that liquid water. So if it had rainfall, that stopped, it lost so sort of the hydrological cycle in the atmosphere. And uh, then it started to just lose its liquid water, to lose those great northern hemisphere seas and to uh, re be reduced to the situation we have today, which is an, an ice cap of frozen water, but nothing uh, liquid on the surface. Uh, there could be a, a occasional seeps at the surface, but because the atmosphere is so uh, low pressure, it's practically a vacuum, everything just sublimates straight into the atmosphere. So Mars is a huge sink for, for that. And that's one of the reasons 
one of the reasons that Mars is uh, basically sterilizing, it's sterilizing to life on the surface. So as we were commenting today, uh, if you took your kombucha, which is full of living microbes, and poured it onto the surface of, of Mars, uh, in a very short time, there'd be no living microbes left. Perhaps a few would survive if, if that, that booch went underneath a slab of rock for a while, it was protected by the, uh, from the ultraviolet coming in. But that booch would be lifeless, very, it would be sterilized. So, as we see Alan behind us popping in and out of curiosity. So it seems like we've got our studio set up. We've got our quorum of 35 participants. So that was a bit of an introduction to uh, the why we are here question, because we have liquid water on the surface. And people just say it's a given, but it's not. It's, it's probably very rare. So if biospheres emerge, microbial biosphere is the simplest about complex plants and animals, the planets will often basically become, un, you know, leave the habitable zone underneath that biosphere and force that biosphere to adapt so that it can't live on the surface anymore. So life on Venus or life on Mars couldn't be surface. It has to go into the rocks and live there in a uh, environment that's chemically possible for it to survive. And so possibly of the trillions of exoplanets and Earth-like worlds out there uh, that had a shot at developing a microbial microbial biosphere, uh, most of them, uh, the planets left habitability and the biosphere is locked in the rock. It's really a lith lithobiospheres. And when you're a, a small organism, a small consortia, community of organisms locked in rock, in wet rock, you're not going to ever evolve. It's unlikely you'll evolve to breathe oxygen uh, or become a multicellular, maybe multicellular forms could emerge, but you can't imagine plants or animals really emerging in such a refuge, such a tight packed refuge. So possibly most of the life in the universe is rock bound uh, microbial communities, uh, which are seed pods in a sense that if the host planet is disrupted and there's big chunks of it floating around the ring of the galaxy, it could produce the panspermia effect of dropping all that microbial material into new wet worlds that it has a shot at developing. But you know, just consider that until Gaia emerged, and Gaia, is by the definition of James Lovelock, is a a biosphere in which can maintain its temperature within range. It can it, can, it runs the thermostat by changing gas content. And Gaia, uh, with the rise of land plants, and probably algaes and other things making a huge contribution, had enough oxygen to support large org organisms and then had enough cycling to support uh, the reduction of too much CO2 when there's too much and in in, in its increase when there's too little, and therefore modifying the solar radiation load on the, on the planet, in the atmosphere, so we kept in that range. So life itself kept liquid water going for itself, uh, despite earlier planetary freezeovers when the Earth was a big snowball, or heating events like the, the Permian extinction, probably uh, uh, that was before before Gaia. So Gaia is sort of tar these are considered to have been started four, four, three, four, five hundred million years ago, maybe, I guess, the Devonian when land plants were rising. So Gaia is really young. So this idea of life maintaining its own environment planet wide is a really new concept. And Lovelock also states that we're going, uh, Gaia is going to lose control of that thermostat. And sooner than we thought, maybe within a few hundred million years, Gaia will or the system will be unable to account for the increase in solar radiation from the sun, the natural increase, and uh, we'll start to flip to Venus conditions. So we'll cross over that terminator and Earth will become Venus inevitably. And then our planet also will have microbial communities will be the only survivors and they'll go into the rock. Uh, and that might be sooner than we think in the geological record. And it should give us pause to think that here we are on Zoom, 
we're complex organisms, we're rare. We, we uh, are in a spectacular output of four and a half billion years of evolution and arising. And uh, here we are, and we're just, we're extremely rare. We're rare like the earth is rare. And we're now sending, about to send, the first uh, seriously intentioned, well-equipped vehicle to Mars, launching at 4.30 in the morning this Thursday, Mars 2020, to uh, look for evidence, uh, not directly of life, because to look for microbes on the surface of Mars is, is as I explained earlier, is implausible because it's a sterilizing environment. So you're not going to find uh, mats of cells and things that haven't been completely broken down to their components. Uh, so we won't find living things on Mars. We won't even find, we won't find bones or shells or, you know, much, much we would use for evidence for life here. But we will find biosignature, or we're looking for biosignatures or textures, rock uh, signatures and textures in the rock called stromatolites. Uh, which uh, Alex will get into later as well. And so uh, that's, so we're, here we are, we're at this precipice, despite uh, a global pandemic and all the stresses, the psychological stresses, economic, bodily stresses on our civilization, but we persevere in going forward and, and, and on this quest of asking, are we alone? Are we, or are we together? Or can life arise in another world? even if we find just a trace of a chemical signature or ripples in a rock on this mission, uh, that can life arise in another world? How rare are we? You know, how common is life? And we're going to a dead world. We're going to a vision of our future, you know, far future for us, but we're going to a world that left habitability on the surface, which our world will uh, in the next several hundred million years, it looks like. So it's a, in a breathtaking moment that, that we're at right now where we're still pursuing. We're saying it's a small amount of resource uh, relative to what we spend on things that are way less productive, such as wars. But we're still curious enough and visionary enough and ballsy enough to do this. And when we do this, we lift up, I think, the mission of all of human beings. We lift ourselves out of our daily concerns and kind of nastiness of politics. And frankly, in 500 years, no one's going to remember the nastiness of politics. They're, they're not going to want to look at it, for one thing. They're going to remem remember visionary things that were done, like Mars exploration. So what we're going to do now with that long introduction is to, I'm going to introduce Alex Longo. And he's going to go through a chunk of really cool images, a very short slide set. Uh, up to uh, because he worked from age 13 when he wrote to JPL uh, asking if he could be part of the next Mars mission, the discussions of the next Mars mission. At age 13, uh, he was in, I guess that's junior high in Canada, it's grade school, middle school, and here in the US. And he, he and I have got to know each other really well because. We were both, I joined late. I joined the uh, site selection team that he was on for Columbia Hills, and he'll explain why he joined Columbia Hills. I joined only in the last two meetings where NASA had this five-year exhaustive process of input. I think over 20 sites narrowed down to three, and we were in the final three. It was pretty dramatic stuff to choose where to send a single rover, because this is a single rover, not two like Opportunity and Spirit were. This is a copy of Curiosity, so it's one big machine. So you don't really have, well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of push and shove over where, where it goes because you don't have a second option for the mission. So you, you really have to commit to what you're, what you're doing. So we served on this wonderful Columbia Hills team. Uh, they didn't select our site, and Alex can get into a little bit more on, on that. It's sort of the predilection of uh, people, they want to go to a new place. Whereas when we do our field work in Australia and we find something interesting, we go back to the same place. That's, that's how you advance uh, science at that point. When you have few resources, you really want to explore as much as you possibly can. And 
future missions are being considered for Columbia Hills uh, to go to a site that looks like an old hot spring. It's strongly indicative of an old hot spring where we think uh, life can start. And Alex and I developed a paper, uh, which we can put in the, uh, the chat for everyone that was published in April, I believe. Uh, and it's a paper called Factoring Origin of Life Hypotheses into the Search for Life uh, title like that. And it's the first time that really two or competing origin of life hypotheses have been factored against where we look for life in our solar system and beyond. And Alex is the lead author on this paper. It was published in Dave Geemer's special issue in the journal Life. And I'm very proud of him for pulling it together despite huge amounts of reviewer back and forth. The dreaded reviewer number three appeared. Uh, so, but the paper uh, got put all together and is, is being cited and read a lot. And so really in some ways, this salon is in sort of in honor of Alex and his first publication just as a freshman in college. Uh, and uh, it just gives me great pleasure to introduce Alex Longo, who's calling him the East Coast. It's probably already way past your bedtime, but you're not that young anymore, right, Alex? Uh, actually, this is kind of is past my bedtime, but it, uh, it's an honor to be here, Bruce. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I feel kind of bad having to follow up on it. <laughs> um, I imagine Marvin the Martian probably would have been your first choice for a guest, but uh, his Earth launch window doesn't open for two weeks. Um, I think we're, um, before we go to questions, we're just going to go through a set of slides real quick, talking about um, really this uh, exciting new era in Mars exploration that we're going to be entering this year, uh, starting with the Perseverance mission. Um, I think this is genuinely one of the most exciting things that we have ever tried to do in space. We're going to go to Mars and look for evidence of life. And I think as Bruce alluded to, the name per Perseverance is just a perfect choice for this rover because even in the midst of the pandemic and all of the hardships that we're going through, we as a country and we as a species are pushing through, we're persevering. I think that's really one of the things that makes humans special as a species. Someday we may find other life or other civilizations out there in the universe, and they may be as intelligent as we are, but I doubt they're going to be as tenacious uh, as we are. And I think that's really one of the things that sets us apart. So to go into Perseverance itself, um, the rover really has three major objectives which have never been attempted before in any mission to any other planet. Uh, the big ticket I am is going to be the search for life on Mars. Um, yesterday, NASA uh, gave a press conference about the mission and the NASA administrator, um, Jim Bridenstine, said that this is the first uh, mission dedicated to astrobiology. And so if you think about it, this is going to be the first time that we have ever seriously searched for life on another planet. Uh, we tried with the Viking missions back in the 1970s, and those results were inconclusive. But here, we're going with much better tools, uh, and we're going with a much better understanding of what to look for. Uh, now, as for what perseverance might find that could be evidence of life. Um, you can see on the top left a, picture, a beautiful picture of what geologists call a stromatolite in a place called the Pilbara in Australia. And what this is, is it's basically a stack of layers of dead microbes that have built up over millennia. They've cemented themselves to the rock that they lived on top of, and as the microbes died, they left behind proteins, cell walls, uh, other ingredients that stuck together. And gradually, you get this beautiful layered stromatolite. Um, now, 
this is what we would love to find on Mars. If we saw something like this, we would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Mars was a living planet. It would be an incredible discovery. Now, chances are Perseverance isn't going to find uh, something, uh, something that provides this sort of clear, conclusive evidence in favor of life on Mars. Because, uh, first of all, Mars lost its water and its atmosphere pretty early in its history. Uh, Mars was really only a warm and wet planet for 200 or 300 million years before the magnetic field went away and it lost its atmosphere. So probably life wouldn't have had time to evolve cell structures like the ribosome um, and uh, advanced protein translation machinery, which you need to leave behind something like a stromatolite. So instead, we're going to need to go and look for uh, different lines of evidence, um, uh, which together you can build up into uh, a clear and conclusive picture that there was life on Mars. Um, now, maybe some of you are gardeners. Uh, I am Bruce's. Uh, if you are, I presume you've had trouble with the deer or the rabbits. Uh, and looking for life with perseverance is kind of going to be like figuring out what broke into your garden. You're not going to be able to catch the culprit in the act. So you're going to need to look for things like their footprints in the dirt, um, holes in your fence, and bites taken out of your tomatoes to, um, to tell what was in your garden and what it was doing. Uh, same thing with life on Mars. We're going to look for things like concentrations of um, elements essential to life in ways that, um, that could not be produced uh, without biological activity. Uh, as you can see in the, uh, the Sarah image, uh, here are some X-ray map, uh, some maps made with an X-ray spectrometer of what that might look like. Uh, some veins of minerals, which we might detect that could point towards life on Mars. We might also look for special shapes in the rocks, which you might not expect to, uh, to see without the presence of life. You can see on the bottom left, uh, these are some silica center nodules um, photographed by my colleague Steve Ruff in Chile. And uh, these uh, really cannot form without uh, microbial communities being embedded in the rocks and growing with the center nodules themselves to make these uh, complex digitate structures, um, like these uh, little pieces of rock sitting at, uh, sticking out of the center cobble. And in fact, we may have already seen evidence of this on Mars from one of our earlier rovers, Spirit. Uh, we'll probably get to that in a few slides. Um, now, one of the things that really makes Perseverance special is it carries two new instruments for astrobiology. Uh, at, one of those is called Pixel. Uh, that's the one on the top right. Uh, yeah, top right. And then the other one is called Sherlock. That's on, um, that's on the bottom right. And what they're going to do is they're going to look at rocks on Mars in two different wavelengths, infrared and ultraviolet. These are two different uh, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, the spectrum of light, which we can't see with our eyes. But using these detectors, the rover will be able to see. And it's going to map at a microscopic scale what the rocks look like in these two wavelengths. And then scientists on Earth are going to be able to compare the maps made by these instruments and say, OK, maybe uh, this looks uh, suspiciously uh, like it's evidence of biological activity. It's what we call a biosignature, something that's not necessarily proof that life existed, but it strongly suggests that microbes were there in the past. And then the rover can drill into that, take a sample, and store it for a return to Earth. These, but anyway, these are the two most sophisticated spectrometers we have ever sent to Mars. 
And they're really the workhorses that are going to make the search for life on this mission possible. Uh, okay, and uh, for some reason I can't advance to the next slide. Oh, hey, there we go, okay. Uh, now the search for life is getting most of the attention. Uh, we've been fascinated with life on Mars ever since astronomers in the early 1900s thought they saw canals through their telescopes. But one of the other big things this rover is going to be doing is it's going to be taking the first steps to return samples from Mars to Earth. These are going to be because uh, instruments like Pixel and Sherlock are incredible. They're wonderful pieces of technology uh, which thousands of people uh, spe uh, spent uh, large chunks of their lives to developing. But anything that you can send to Mars on a rover uh, isn't going to be as sophisticated as what you have in a lab on Earth. Um, something like Sherlock is probably about the size of my cell phone, whereas its equivalent on Earth is about the size of a refrigerator. So you're going to have, on Earth, you're going to have better instruments, and you're going to have many more instruments than you could ever send to Mars. And in fact, uh, this mission called Mars Sample Return is going to be really, that's going to be what allows us to definitively prove that there was life in the Mars 2020 samples. From the rover's investigations on the surface, we might be able to find the biosignatures, but it'll probably take the return of samples to Earth to uh, prove for once and for all there was life. Um, this is a three-step process. It'll probably take the better part of a decade, um, and it involves three different robots. Um, the 2020 Perseverance <laughs> rover is going to be the first. That's launching it in less than two seconds. Uh, that will go there. It'll uh, land in Jezero Crater, and it's going to spend about two years driving around, drilling into rocks, and taking about 40 different samples that, ha uh, that, um, that have those biosignatures in them. The rover's gonna package them up and leave them on the surface. Now, six years from now, uh, two more uh, missions to Mars are gonna launch. One is going to be from the United States and one's from the European Space Agency. Um, and those missions are gonna work together to return the samples. Uh, NASA's going to put a lander on Mars with uh, a smaller rover provided by the Europeans. The rover will pick up those samples directed by controllers on Earth, bring it back to the lander, package them into a rocket, uh, a, a relatively small rocket, probably about the size of a person, but still the first rocket we have ever tried to fire on another planet. And then that'll launch those samples into orbit on, uh, around Mars, where another spacecraft will pick them up bring them back to Earth safe and sound for analysis here. As you can probably tell, this is a pretty complicated plan. Um, in fact, I think it's probably the hardest thing we've tried to do in space since we sent humans to the moon in the 1960s. Uh, but I also think that we are better prepared now to pull this off than we ever have been. And if all of these steps work right and we get those samples back, around 2030 or 2031, uh, we're going to learn more about Mars and our solar system than we have at any time in human history. So that's something to really be excited about. And then the last big thing that Mars 2020 is going to be doing is it's really gonna be laying the groundwork for sending humans to Mars. Robots are great. We've learned a lot from our robot explorers, our rovers, our orbiters, our landers. But in the end, a rover does in 15 years what uh, one of us could do in a weekend. Uh, so in the end, to really explore Mars and get to know it, we need to send astronauts. I certainly would love to be one of the uh, people who would go. Maybe uh, a few of you would like to go as well. Uh, and this mission is going to be one of the first big steps help us get there.
Um, probably one of my favorite parts of this mission is it's actually going to have a small helicopter on board. Uh, the helicopter is called Ingenuity, uh, and uh, it's probably about the size of a shoebox. It's relatively small, but it's going to become the first thing to ever fly on another planet. Uh, it'll be a milestone in history of aviation and space flight. And it's going to do five short flights to prove for once and for all that you can uh, fly in the Martian atmosphere. This is a big challenge because uh, Mars' Mars's atmosphere is about one one hundredth as dense as our atmosphere on Earth. So the rower blades on the tip of the helicopter, I believe, need to be spinning at three quarters of the speed of sound just for it to take off. Uh, it's a pretty amazing engineering feat. Um, but if this works, then uh, helicopters could potentially be used to collect samples for future Mars sample return missions, or you might be able to use them as scouts for astronauts on Mars, so that the astronauts have good maps of the places they're going before they set out in their rovers. Um, and then if you look to the left of the picture of Eng Ingenuity, 2020 also has uh, an experiment called MOXIE, that I believe it's a NASA acronym. NASA loves acronyms. I believe it's for the Mars Oxygen In Situ Experiment or something like that. But its goal is to produce oxygen from the atmosphere of Mars. Mars's atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide. Um, what we hate to hear about on Earth is everywhere on Mars. And um, it's going to be uh, collected in this experiment. It's going to be broken down into carbon monoxide and oxygen. And then if you were an astronaut, you might be able to collect this oxygen and use it to breathe, or you can combine it with something like methane or uh, liquid hydrogen and turn that into rocket fuel that can get you home. Uh, I'd love to go to Mars, but um, only if it's a return trip. Um, and then and just two more things real quick that 2020 is going to be doing for humans. Uh, it's going to be carrying a radar ca called RIMFAX. Um, no, that label's wrong. Um, but uh, RIMFAX is uh, contributed by the Norwegian Space Agency, and it's going to penetrate down to 30, between 30 and 100 meters uh, below the surface of Mars, 100 to 300 feet, about the length of a football field. And what it's going to be able to do is maybe look for deposits of subsurface water ice. Uh, water is essential for life on Earth, and it's also going to be essential for li uh, life on Mars if and when we make the trip. Uh, so if we're able to find that water, then we might be able to harvest it using a subsurface drill. Uh, and uh, and RIMFAX on Mars 2020 is the first big step to, uh, towards uh, detecting those water ice resources. And then finally, uh, 2020's got a camera on the bottom called Terrain Relative Navigation. And basically, that is Google Maps for Mars. Uh, it takes pictures of the surface of Mars, it compares it to a map taken by an orbiting satellite, and it allows the rover to guide itself to a precise touchdown uh, wherever you want it to go. And that's going to be really important for when we send people because uh, you're not going to send everything in one lander. You're probably going to need two, three, maybe even four big landers full of cargo. And you want them all near each other so that the astronauts don't have to walk too far between them. Um, so, um, so one of the first steps um, in the Mars 2020 mission, as they prepared it for launch, was the selection of a landing site. And you see on the left all sorts of different criteria they use to, uh, to narrow down the list of potential locations where you can go. Um, and if you look at the map on the right, everything uh, that ha has the white shading over it was eliminated because it's too cold. If you sent the rover there, the electronics would freeze and it would die. And then all of the areas with the black mask on top of it 
are high elevation sites. So there's not enough air for you to slow down. It would be amazing to go somewhere like Olympus Mons, a mountain three times as high as Mount Everest that's on Mars, but you wouldn't be able to land safely. So you're left with about 10% of the surface of the planet. Uh, you see that's kind of the blues and greens. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but they still got over 30 amazing site proposals for these fascinating locations that we can go visit with the rover. And um, this was actually where I got involved in the mission. Um, I wrote a site proposal and sent it to John Grant and to Matt Gollenbeck, um, who were the two leaders of the workshop. And I didn't expect much. Maybe I would get some cool t-shirts and posters. But uh, much to my surprise and my eternal gratitude to Matt and John, they let me attend the first workshop. And um, in the end, I was uh, lucky enough to be able to go to all four and uh, see the scientific process for how they select these places in its entirety. Uh, and um, uh, and Bruce, if you, I think this will be a great place to bring in your origin of life hypothesis for hot springs on Earth. Um, so um, maybe you'd like to discuss that. Yeah, so I'm going to jump in here because as a prelude to uh, the description discussion that Alex will do about Columbia Hills. Uh, this is a, just a brief overview of our scenario for an origin of life on Earth to, in a terrestrial subaerial landscape above, above the ocean and volcanic islands exposed to the atmosphere. And if uh, Alex will hit the first tab, it's a bit of an animated thing. So what we start with is the synthesis of a lot of the organic compounds in the solar system as it's forming. And this dusty disk we, that we now see in other solar systems, how they form with the planets sort of vacuuming out the material as the planets are forming and then having access to all this organic material. So that's all forming there in the solar system. The next uh, text tab. So what that sets up is an accumulation of organic material at the surface. And as that accumulates, the next, next tab, as it accumulates, you get a concentration of it. And what we've done in the lab at UC Santa Cruz is we've taken bits of meteorites that are old, that are the age of the Earth, 4.6 billion years, thereabouts, that would have been some of the material falling on the Earth around the time of the origin of life, which could have been anywhere 4.2 billion years, 3.7 billion years, we'll never know. Uh, and we put it into buffer acid solution and it separates out. This is a special kind of meteorites called carbonaceous chondrites and out, out comes lipid membranes. So we see membranous material release. We see amino acids release, nucleobases, sugars, uh, a lot of organic compounds in these meteorites that were formed in solar system formation in the chemistry of the solar system. It's not alive, but it's organic. If, if you can make that distinction. The next, uh, next shot. So when this stuff gets concentrated in pools, concentrated enough, it can start to react. It can become like a chemical soup, uh, sort of a primordial soup, if you will. And what we're showing on our landscape on the little bar on the left is increasing complex, complexity of chemistry from the compounds forming from falling from space forming membranous compartments out of that material from the meteorite. And then those compartments uh, can capture uh, these compounds and through wet, dry cycling, and where the dry phase allows the stitching together of polymers familiar to all of us, things like that are like RNA, potentially like DNA and like proteins, from the building blocks available, not only in space, but out in the uh, you have a beach, beach party going on outside. They're all happy about, about Mars 2020 Perseverance. So uh, all this stuff is accumulating and the pools 
that are cycling, the pools that are undergoing uh, wet, dry cycles, the pools undergoing wet, dry cycles are able to push the chemical complexity up. And we've done this now in pools in New Zealand, in Rotorua, New Zealand. And Kitty, who's on, uh, on this call, was one of the people with us in February when we went to uh, Rotorua in just south of Wellington. And we placed our chemical uh, vials and our mica sheets and our water, our, our ancient rocks in the environment of a cycling hot spring. And we were able to, to form these protocells with polymers of RNA in them stitched together. And as we cycle that solution, we get longer and longer polymers. So it's the first stage in the step to life. And if you click again, then when we, what we feel, this is a, the big gap in understanding how to get flimsy little passively self-assembled protocells into living microbes. And that's the great research of the next century, which would be a hundred years of work on this issue, trying to make artificial protocells, cycle them de novo. But we, what we predict is that when they come into clusters, when these protocells come down to the bottom of the pool and become aggregates, they create what Carl Woese called the progenote, the unit that can carry passively assembled life to actively uh, living microbial communities. And so all of this is, is in our astrobiology paper published in March, about the time the paper from Alex and I was, uh, was published in the Life Journal. So it announced the full uh, hypothesis, the full uh, hot spring hypothesis for the origin of life. You hit another tab, Alex. So what we see after all this happens is this mass of protocells, which become living cells, uh, are distributed by water or wind across the landscape and continue to boot up using natural selection, continue to become more robust and they adapt to environments like uh, lake shores, which we find fossil evidence for in Australia, the lacustrine stromatolites, these layered rocks. And then eventually, if you hit the last tab, the seashore, where we see the marine stromatolites, which are uh, ubiquitous in the fossil record. So stromatolites are microbial mats, these rock-like pillars at the, at the marine coasts. And then the last little tab will show us evidence from the rock record. So you can see these three little things coming up, one, two, three, uh, layered stromatolites from a hot spring at 3.48 billion years. The next one is uh, a, uh, that's lacustrine, that's lakeshore stromatolite from 2.7 billion years ago. And the last one is a big domical marine stromatolite from uh, all the same region in Australia, beautifully preserved piece of Archean crust. So that's our, our current working model for how we believe life can start on the early earth. And we've got the first few chemical steps uh, to work empirically. It's a long way from being going from a hypothesis to a theory and a theory to kind of a law. Uh, but it's a, it's a beginning, and it's the first time our field has had a working hypothesis that can be tested at many levels. And there are six or seven teams working on this now around the world. And I was invited to present this very model at the third and fourth workshops that uh, uh, for the Columbia Hills team, uh, because Columbia Hills, and as you'll hear from Alex, by happenstance, about the same time Dave Deemer and I were meeting, and starting our work on the hot spring hypothesis, uh, the spirit rover discovered uh, what seemed like a preserved ancient hot spring on Mars from about the time of the origin of life on Earth, around the same half a billion year period anyway. And when I saw that article, I sort of rushed to Dave and I said, look at this, a hot spring on Mars that looks like a Yellowstone. It looks like a Kamchatka, it looks like a Rotorua. And how exciting and what if one day we could send a mission to go back there because it would bolster our uh, arguments that life can start on a world around in a hot spring setting. 
So with that, I'll hand it back to Alex. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I still remember the first time I read about the hot spring hypothesis that um, you and Dave put together um, a, a few years ago, and uh, it, it shocks me how uh, how far the science of astrobiology has advanced just in la the last decade or two. Um, I mean, the hot spring model uh, that you guys have put together, and then also the uh, ocean vent model by um, uh, by Michael Russell and his collaborators at JPL. Um, really, what we're able to do right now is leaps and bounds beyond stuff you may have read about in textbooks like the Miller-Urey Miller experiments and um, and other studies like that. We really are on the verge of starting to understand how and where life have may have may have started on Earth, and um, and based on uh, that observation, uh, about a year ago, uh, Bruce and I decided to um, to jointly uh, write a paper uh, about how we could use these two hypotheses to search for life elsewhere in the solar system. Um, because on Earth, we have for now two, um, two candidates for locations that may have been favorable to an origin of life. Um, we've got these cycling hot springs that uh, Bruce just talked about, where you, have, um, where you have water levels rising and falling in freshwater pools, uh, and you've got pro cells forming and potentially polymer, polymers being encapsulated in those pro cells. And then uh, that's the environment you can see on the left. And then on the right, you can see uh, a hydrothermal vent. Um, these are typically found um, miles beneath the ocean floor where you've got uh, lava meeting water. And uh, these things are chemical factories turning out uh, monomers, amino acids, and potentially, um, they were the engines that kicks metabolism on Earth. Uh, but the really remarkable thing is that we actually see evidence for both of these environments on Mars. Um, for the hydrothermal, the deep sea hydrothermal vents, uh, we've used our uh, orbiters, um, and in particular the um, high-rise telescope on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to pinpoint this location called the Eridania Basin, which was an ancient sea about the size of the Mediterranean on Earth uh, that, was, that existed on Mars about 4 billion years ago. And in Eridania, you just got these big mesas, um, um, a thousand feet tall, um, and that actually is their height. Um, anywhere from 1,000 to 1,200 feet. And um, they're filled with clays and carbonate uh, minerals, which may have, um, which probably formed in one of these deep sea hydrothermal vents. And we also potentially could see evidence of these environments on the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, like Europa and Enceladus. And then for hot springs, uh, observed several candidate hot spring locations from Earth, uh, uh, from orbit with uh, the high-rise camera, we actually have landed at one of these places. Uh, in 2004, um, NASA landed a rover called Spirit in Gusev Crater on Mars and drove to a location at the uh, called the Columbia Hills. Um, it's a pretty small place, about five kilometers by three kilometers. Uh, but within this small region, Spirit found um, these nodules of silica sinter. Um, uh, you may have seen the picture uh, on the slide about Perseverance's um, goal of astrobiology. You saw one of these couples on Earth. Here are some pretty similar couples on Mars. And recall that um, that on Earth, these sorts of structures could only form in the presence of microbial life. So this right here is a, bio, is a potential biosignature. 
And uh, that led um, Bruce, myself, and several of our colleagues to propose the Columbia Hills as a landing site for Perseverance. Started in 2013, um, and the process lasted until 2018. Uh, there was a lot of work by everybody involved, from NASA to our landing site proposers to the engineers at JPL, all working together to evaluate these landing sites. But uh, in the center, you can kind of see uh, a picture from uh, that high-rise telescope. Uh, it can uh, image things as small as your dinner plate. Uh, it's an amazing instrument, uh, and you can see uh, in the circle, uh, the loca a location called Home Plate. It's an ancient Martian volcano, uh, which uh, created, uh, which generated the heat, power of these hot springs. And um, you can see uh, over uh, far, far left in the center, uh, another picture of nodules that was most likely uh, that most likely formed in a hot spring in environment. Uh, so this was an exceptional site from the standpoint of astrobiology and searching for life on Mars. Uh, as far as returning samples go, there are uh, there were also lots of other different types of rocks and minerals which Perseverance could have collected and put in its sample cache for return to Earth. Uh, you can see to the right of the Sarah nodule, you've got a mineral called carbonate. And carbonate only forms in, carbonate forms in lakes, and it only forms in lakes that have neutral water, which is important because uh, a lot of Martian lakes have a lot of sulfur around them. And that means that the lake would have been highly acidic when, uh, when it was active on the planet's surface. You would be swimming in battery acid, basically. But because you've got carbonate, that means the water was neutral and this would have potentially been a nice place for microbes to live. And then finally, you've got some sulfur as well. Um, and that proves that next to these hot springs, you have these, uh, uh, this other type of environment called fumaroles which would have also been uh, produced in interactions between lava and water, but, um, but they would have been a bit more. Uh, however, um, even though that may not sound like a nice place to live, on Earth, whenever you go to a fumarole, you find microbes called extremophiles that thrive in those locations. And we had an exceptional team for that site proposal. Um, you can see um, Bruce is to the far left in the picture. Um, and then I am uh, second from, uh, from right. Um, but we had um, scientists from, uh, uh, from both coasts of the United States, um, as well as from Australia and New Zealand working together to create um, to create this vision of what a search for life on Mars could be like. It was um, I'm to this day proud to be a part of uh, this team and this effort. Um, now, in the end, um, we made it to the final three for landing site uh, for uh, the final landing site workshop, but uh, in the end. NASA had to make a very hard call among three highly qualified, really interesting landing sites. And uh, I then settled on a place called Jezero Crater. Um, and what's interesting about Jezero is it has this beautiful river delta emptying into the crater. Uh, you might think of somewhere like the Mississippi Delta or the Nile Delta or the Amazon Delta. Um, if you've got a river delta, it means that there was a lot of water at this location. And uh, Jezero also has lots of minerals like clays and the carbonates, um, which I mentioned in, in relation to the Columbia Hills, which proved that this lake may have been uh, 
that, that this lake probably had near neutral pH and may have been a good for microbes. And not only that, deltas are very good at preserving things like organic materials and potentially stromatolites if they ever existed on Mars. Uh, so Jezero is a really exciting place to start our search for life with perseverance. And uh, the thing that really sold NASA, which came up at the last workshop, is that from Jezero Crater, uh, you actually can go to a, a second landing site, uh, which they called uh, Midway. You can see Jezero top right, Midway lower left, and you would go over the, uh, over the rim of Jezero Crater and out into the surrounding plains. Uh, it would probably be about a 30 or a 40 mile drive. Um, it would take you 10 or 15 years and you would be going over very rough terrain. So it's probably on the edge of feet. But if everything goes well with per Perseverance's primary mission, which is to explore this delta and look for biosignatures, then this might be an exciting option we can consider as an encore. Now, I would be out uh, mentioning one more aspect of the Jezero site, which is that we actually don't really know how old this delta is. Um, the leading interpretation is that it's probably almost, uh, that it's from back when Mars was warm and wet, uh, somewhere, between, somewhere between three and a half and four billion years old. Uh, but uh, for the prior to the fourth workshop, um, um, several researchers went through images of the Jezero site, um, primarily Maureen Van Krandock from Australia, um, and uh, Jim Rice from Arizona, and they looked at the, uh, these images and saw that actually maybe this delta is on top of uh, the lava floor of the crater, in which case it's a lot you know, younger, maybe three and a half, uh, uh, maybe one and a half or two years old, uh, in which case uh, maybe by this point there were, uh, were no more microbes on the surface. So I think that's one of the things I'm really excited to find out about when we go to Jezero, which is how old is this delta and how long did it last? Um, I'm actually uh, good friends with the lead site proposer for Jezero, not Jezero Crater, um, Tim Gow, which I believe he's at the University of Texas now. Um, but Tim and his team did an excellent job proposing this site. And uh, I have nothing for them as um, they begin their exploration using perseverance. And I mean, who knows, hopefully we might find uh, biosignatures and evidence that there was once life on Mars that would be a transformational discovery. Um, now, perseverance is, was our main topic for today, but um, there are also two more missions going to Mars this year. Um, it's, I believe more missions have been launched to Mars during this launch window during, than during any other in history. Um, the first mission to fly launched, I'd say, about two weeks ago, and it's uh, an orbiter called HOPE from the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and HOPE is the first Mars mission launched from the, uh, from the UAE, which is a really incredible achievement considering that the only other countries to have successfully conducted a Mars mission are the United States. Uh, the European Union and India. And uh, the UAE in comparison is a relatively small country and it really says something about their engineering prowess that they were able to pull this off. Um, and uh, HOPE is going to be basically the first weather satellite for Mars. It's going to enter into a long elliptical orbit around the planet. It'll take several days to finish that orbit. And it, that means that you're not going to get pictures that are high resolution, but it means that you can look at the entire plan shot. 
So you can see how weather uh, patterns transform and evolve over the course of a Martian day, which is going to be really important for when we eventually send humans there. You want to, know, you want to be able to forecast the weather. Uh, we actually lost uh, last year one of our Mars rovers, Opportunity. It had um, exceeded its warranty by 60 times. It was supposed to last 90 days. It ended up lasting 15 years. But uh, eventually there was a dust storm. Um, it blew over the Opportunity site. We didn't have much warning it was coming and the rover wasn't able to survive that. So hopefully missions like HOPE are going to um, allow us to avoid difficulties like that with future missions. And then the second mission, uh, it launched only a few days after HOPE, uh, is from China. It's called Tianwen Wan, which means in Chinese, questions to heaven. And uh, this is China's first Mars mission, um, uh, just like the UAE. This is the, this is the first time that uh, either of these countries have tried to reach Mars. And it's an extremely ambitious plan. They've got on this one mission, an orbiter with a high resolution camera, uh, a lander, and a rover about the size of uh, Spirit, the rover that explored the Columbia Hills. Um, so probably it's uh, the most ambitious um, mission ever attempted by uh, a country on, during their first Mars launch window. And uh, actually of these three components, I personally am most excited about the Orbiter because it's going to have a high resolution camera that might be able to complement the capabilities of uh, high rise on uh, our Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which will allow us to scout out landing sites and uh, search for locations that may have been habitable in the past. And then it's also got, going to have a ground penetrating radar uh, Perseverance actually already has one of the, uh, Perseverance also has one of these, but uh, Tianwen is going to be able to scan the entire surface of Mars at a lower resolution and look for uh, subsurface water as astronauts might be able to use for water or for rocket fuel. Uh, and then, actually, there was supposed to be a fourth Mars mission that was go, uh, going to launch this year as well, called ExoMars. Um, and this was a major multinational project from 23 countries. Um, and the leaders were Russia, Italy, Germany, and the UK. Um, it, was a, uh, it, it, it was a pretty amazing collection of brain power and resources that will mission, this mission together. Um, and what ExoMars was supposed to do was it was supposed to land on Mars. Uh, there was a rover somewhere between the size of Spirit and Perseverance that was supposed to drive off the lander and uh, drill up to two meters or six feet below Mars. And the idea behind the drill was that um, any organic material on the surface may have been destroyed by radiation. But if you dig down deep, you might be able to find organic material, which is one of those biosignatures, potential signs of life. Um, unfortunately, uh, they ran into more problems than expected with the parachutes. Um, landing on Mars is one of the hardest things that you uh, can do in the field of space exploration. The parachute system is extremely complex. And then COVID-19 kind of piled on on top of that. And ExoMars had to be delayed to the next Mars launch window in 2022. You can only go to Mars about years. But um, when that flies, I certainly wish them uh, the best of luck. And uh, hopefully uh, it'll be worth the wait. And then um, uh, kind of to wrap things up, I wanted to turn things back to Bruce. Um, Bruce has been working on an exciting concept for how we might be able to reduce the cost of sending humans to Mars, because that really is the ultimate goal for Mars exploration. Thank you, Alex, for that great coverage of all the current missions. I'm clapping from the peanut gallery in Santa Cruz. 
And uh, so I'd like to uh, I'd like to present one last little vision for us here. Uh, this is a a project uh, from about three four years ago when I met Peter Janiskins, and Peter Janiskins is uh, a leading asteroid astronomer from the SETI Institute, and his work is on the composition of asteroids, trying to track them when they're coming in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and go and pick them up on the surface. And he and I were meeting at the contact conference. This is in 2014. Don Scott, who's on this uh, on this Zoom, was also at that conference. And we came up with this design by which, and if you see on the left uh, image of the slide uh, number five, uh, you see a large fabric structure uh, a balloon, call it, if you could call it that, coming up to an asteroid and then pushing itself to closure around the asteroid and introducing a controlling gas. And I could show you the movie on this, but I'm just, in the interest of time, we're just going to look at how this works from the distance. Once you've got the asteroid inside a sealed enclosure, you introduce a controlling gas, probably helium, and that controlling gas have friction, friction with the asteroid as it's tumbling, because they're all kind of rotator tumblers, and gradually slow its spin until it stops. And then waves of gas, kind of like blowing into the balloon, could rotate the asteroid into sort of a sailing ship position and start to impart a small amount of a, a force, or what you would call delta V in the space business, and start to change its orbit. So what we would do is go out past Mars to what's called the snow line, where you have water ice that's perhaps under a thin crust on these asteroids, uh, but is, is liberatable. So we get an asteroid in an enclosure. We use uh, absorptive black material on one side of the enclosure to pull in sunlight and heat the controlling gas and start to heat up the asteroid. So as we move it toward Mars, we we're literally sublimating the vapor. We're getting water vapor, or CO2, whatever is there in those ices into the enclosure. And then we pump that down and we condense it uh, with a cold plate condensing into tanks. And we have liquids, those all important volatiles I was mentioning at the beginning. We could have like 500 tons of uh, separated uh, water. We could have CO2, we could have methane. Uh, and then we could start chemical reactions with them electrolysis to separate them into fuels. So instead of having to crack this out of the Mars atmosphere, which is one approach, you come with a water ice uh, meteoritic dis resolved uh, sources into Mars orbit. So it shows uh, the shepherd arriving in Mars orbit. We call this shepherd in the uh, spacecraft means secure handling uh, but through encapsulation of planetesimals headed for Earth, Moon, retrograde delivery. It's a mouthful for me. Uh, but on the right uh, image uh, on the slide, it shows Shepard fuel, which is a tanker block uh, that is now full of fuel, maybe hundreds of tons of it, uh, in Mars orbit, waiting for the Earth ship to arrive. When the Earth ship arrives, first thing that happens before anything else is the empty cartridge is take, is, comes off, and then a full cartridge from the Shepard balloon resource extractor gets attached to the ship. Now it has return fuel and a lot of landing site fuel, a lot of fuel for operations from, in orbit itself. And then the empty, just like a CO2 canister you take back to the hardware store, uh, gets put back on the Shepard capture system and gets refueled. So you have a you know, petrol or gas station in Mars orbit that could support multiple missions. This same system could be in Earth orbit or cislinar space or wherever you want it. Other variants of Shepard allow, would allow you to extract metals from very metal-rich metal meteorites using the Mond electroforming process to make parts in space, really large parts. So we could build Stanley Kubrick's space station or build in space in a form of 3D printing. And then a third variant of Shepard not shown here is where instead of just sublimating all that ice off of the asteroid, you melt the asteroid to a globule 
so that you have a water globule around a rocky core and then you inoculate it with microbes and planktons and even like shrimp for the barbie. Uh, and you have a small world that is mobile, lit by the inside by lighting that's solar powered on the outside, and you've created a small biosphere, if you will. And that that could be for the future feeding of large megastructures, people living in megastructures or anywhere in space. Uh, you, you can produce biologically sourced things like foodstuffs and chemicals and everything. So the, this Shepard design, which was presented to NASA in 2014, and then I did a TEDx talk here in 2015 to give it away to the world community is being uh, actively developed uh, in concert with Carlos Calva uh, to create a company around this, initially to do satellite servicing. So if we can capture an asteroid, we can capture a satellite, manipulate it, change its orbit, and safely handle it. Uh, now, that's all been a uh, little interrupted through COVID, but that's where we're at. And we think that we could, uh, if this worked, by the, say, end of the 2030s, we could be supplying fuel in the solar system, fuel, and eventually metals, uh, construction parts, uh, and uh, foodstuffs uh, using this technique without having to land a lot of hardware on a planetary surface and attempt to do it in a challenging way through digging and processing, bulk processing materials. I'm from a family with miners, and I can tell you and mining equipment's always breaking, it's really difficult. So this gas handling with far more resources that's uh, more, more easily available in asteroids may be the better stepping stone to sustainable space flight. And with that, we'll go to the uh, last slide. Uh, yeah, um, thank you for sharing uh, Shepard, Bruce. Um, I worked at NASA headquarters for about six months last year with uh, Rick Davis. And uh, Rick's one of the biggest advocates I know for sending humans to Mars someday. And one of the things he would always try to stress on me is that, um, was that you are never gonna be able to go to Mars if you bring everything with you. Um, think about how much, uh, um, a mission to Mars is going to take 500 days at least. And in those 500 days, think about how much air you breathe, how much water you drink, how much food you eat, and then add on to that several tons of rocket fuel for getting to the surface and back. Uh, that's just too, mu uh, mu uh, too much, too, that's too much for you to bring with you from Earth. And um, I think this is a really innovative solution for getting astronauts the resources they need in orbit to make these sorts of exploration missions successful. And then uh, if we go to the last slide, um, why should you be excited about all of this? Uh, why does sending one robot to Mars at a time like this matter that much? And I think the answer is that we really are on the verge of uh, a new era in the history of human civilization. For and when, for the first time, we are not going to be constricted to just one planet. We're going to be out there uh, uh, exploring the solar system, and one day maybe even the stars. And I think that in the long run that's the most important thing that we could potentially be doing as a species. Um, I mean, people always talk about the moon landings and how they are a high water mark that hasn't been surpassed. But I think the next decade, the 2020s, uh, if all goes according to plan, we're going to see people return to the moon. Uh, we're going to see samples being returned from Mars we're even going to be flying around a giant quadcopter on Saturn's moon Titan. Um, we really live in an age of wonders, and I hope that once in a while we're going to be able to uh, look up uh, at the sky and the stars and really ponder the deep questions about what's out there and, um, and how special is our place in the universe. And um, I think that's, 
Uh, that, that's the best note I can end on if you're ready to go to questions. Thank you so much, Alex. And I, I think we, uh, we're definitely ready for questions. We have about another 45 minutes uh, in our usual two hour schedule, but we hope uh, both of us and Shen Shen Wu, our host here and our regulars, we hope you like this new format of the Levity Salons where we have a guest speaker and uh, we have a bit of back and forth between us and we have some visuals uh, which we've kind of had in the past, but we sort of, we worked hard to make this more of a formal thing. I know that Charles Brownstein had, had commented to me about a year ago, hey, you've got to start holding, you could hold webinars on all these topics and it's good information and good sharing. So Charles, we're, we're doing it now and uh, working up to it. So yeah, let's open the floor to questions. And I think Chen Chen can give us some instructions on that what to do and you can address the question to you know to the ether of the little green men or to myself or Alex or however you want to do it or just making a comment or uh, we'll eventually hopefully end up more of a salon where people are talking amongst themselves but uh, feel free also to put it in the in the chat links and comments okay can we unshare the screen Alex yeah, no problem. Let's see. Um, I can always put up the slides if anyone's got um, questions related to them. But anyway, there's the screen share. No, I seem um, to be. I seem to be off the video. Yeah, I can see your rover background, but I can't see you. Okay. Well, let's let's uh, Shen Shen give us uh, give us instructions on the question. Cool. First of all, thank you, Bruce and Alex, for that wonderful presentation. I'm feeling very inspired, so I appreciate oh, thank that. Thank you. Um, I don't know. Uh, there might be better ways to uh, spend Tuesday evening, but um, I hope you enjoyed it. Not in my book. This was number one for me. So thanks, everyone, for being here, too. Um, thank you. It was an I do see a raised there. hand from Charles. Yeah. Um, from Charles Brownstein. So there's two ways you can do it. You can click participants in the Zoom and then press the button to raise your hand or you can raise your physical hand and I'll keep an eye on the screens and um, queue you up. So first we have Charles. Thanks and uh, thank you Alex and Bruce for the terrific presentation and I'd like to ask a question that kind of ties to Alex's closing point which is how do we capture the popular imagination? Why have these missions not captured the popular imagination in the way that previous generations of space exploration such as the moon missions in the 60s and 70s, um, why haven't these captured the imagination in that way and how should these missions be framed in a way to increase popular interest to make funding of future missions and, and enthusiasm for future missions um, more, more plausible and possible? Thanks. Alex, you want to take that one? Uh, do you want to take the first stab at this, or uh, do you want me to try? You go ahead, uh, take take a stab at that one. Well, um, I think that actually, um, I think that um, people are more excited by this stuff than you might automatically uh, assume. I mean, um, we look back on the moon landings as a technological miracle because it happened 50 years ago and we haven't done it since. But if you look at, I, I now, right now this year, I've seen more people wearing NASA t-shirts than ever before. If you look at movies like The Martian, uh, the movies about space exploration are blockbusters. And because we've got the internet and social media, which we didn't have back in the 60s, it's easier to connect and engage with people. Um, if you look back about two months to the uh, demo to SpaceX uh, launch of astronauts to the space station, um, that was, some people are estimating that 100 million people watched that launch. Uh, which is as many people as watched John Glenn's Flight to Orbit in 1962. 
So um, I think that there really is a lot of popular sentiment among the public that this is one of the things we should be doing. And I think that no matter who you are, whether you're young and old, wherever you're from, wherever your background is, uh, I think that um, the exploration of space, the search for life, the expansion of the human presence into the cosmos is something that captivates people. All right, anything you, uh, uh, Bruce, do you have anything to add? Now this morning, uh, thank you, Alex. So this morning I talked with a big academic publisher in the UK uh, who approached uh, Dave and myself about a new book uh, on that actually would build on uh, our paper, Alex. Uh, part of it would, would build on the paper. And the editor on that call said that it's just an explosion in the field of astrobiology and the number of books uh, in the size of conferences, uh, in the, the diversity of people involved. And in 1965 to 69, sort of the era of Apollo, the late 60s, uh, I think there's an absolute tiny fraction of the people involved in these questions and in space, uh, probably 10% of the people whose careers were in, intersected this and that is happening now. It's just an immense, global interest. When, when I was going to Pakistan to help develop a software business there, uh, people approached me to establish, help them to establish the astrobiology network of Pakistan. And this is a country that in 1960s barely had working phones. And now they've got broadband networks and smartphones and they go world-class software and they are going to have their own space program, but they're starting with an astrobiology network all from Lahore to Islamabad to Karachi and, and just huge keen interest. So I think it's just a, a, an amazing time. There's just a blossoming interest across cultures and across genders and races and um, ages. So anyway, I'll stop there and let some more questions come in. All right, we have a raised hand from James Brown. I'm gonna unmute you. Well, once again, uh, thank you, Bruce and Alex. You guys have managed to uh, peel away the sort of like layers of, um, I don't know what you might call it, but it's a very optimistic viewpoint that you guys present. And it's, uh, it's wonderful to hear somebody as enthusiastic as both of you and presenting it in a way that uh, can actually turn on other people like myself as well. I had a really simple question really is that I knew there was a, um, I had a friend that worked at JPL, his name was Joey, and he was also involved with NASA, but he was working specifically with a, uh, he's an engineer that worked with a parachute system specifically for landing on Mars. And I, he spent a, a long time working on that. It seemed like they figured it out. But Alex, you were saying that it's really complicated. So I'm wondering if maybe there was some uh, issues with the uh, project that Joy was working on or if it hasn't been implemented or so anyway, it's just a simple question because that's sort of like two pieces of information that I was kind of wondering about there. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, um... I'm not, um, I'm not quite sure what parachute project you're referring to, but you are uh, correct in saying that um, landing on Mars is a pretty tough problem. Um, I, I know there are multiple uh, efforts underway at NASA right now trying to look at different types of parachutes and heat shields we can use for Mars landing. And um, Joey was probably working on one of those. But what makes Mars so tough um, when you put it against a place like the moon or Earth is that it's got just enough atmosphere to roast your spacecraft if it's unprotected, but it doesn't have enough atmosphere to slow you down completely. So you can't just pop a parachute and float gently down to the surface like the Apollo astronauts did in their capsules and like um, D uh, Doug Hurley and Bob Bank and Will uh, this Sunday in uh, their Dragon Capsule. Um, it's 
Uh, so really, you have to solve two problems, the atmosphere and the final to set you a heat shield, a parachute, and some sort of rocket system, which is why Mars, uh, which is why half of all missions to Mars fail, um, and why it's such a difficult planet to explore. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. The, the system that he was working on was, uh, I believe it was like a physics problem where it was more about like a torque. It was more about, so it would have been dealing specifically what you're talking about with the, the velocity and uh, reducing the impact. And I think it was more just strictly in how, how to like reverse that sort of velocity, use that energy to then somehow slow down the, the inertia. I don't know. It's a, I didn't know it. I didn't know enough about the details of the project, but I, he was, as he explained it loosely to me once, it was something a little bit more, it didn't have anything to do with the heat seeking, uh, the um, shield part. It was more about the dynamics of the actual. Come to think of it, I may have seen a presentation on that at uh, a conference I was at. Um, and I believe the idea that um, the engineers who were working on it were talking about was you would have an inflatable heat shield and you would have uh, wires attached to that and you could use that to skip off the atmosphere like a rock skipping on a pond and slow down that way. Um, uh, that would be my best guess. Um, is that kind of uh, what you were saying? Yeah, no, that's, no that's, that's good. It's just a general, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next uh, question. We have Alan Lindell in the, in the chat asking, how might these Mars projects dovetail with the plans of Elon Musk? And Howard Hurd also gives that question an upvote as well, it seems. Yeah, I mean, I can jump in here a little bit. Uh, we've been having informal chats with uh, both people on Elon Musk's SpaceX team and uh, with people who work at Blue Origin. Just sort of preliminary, uh, looking at the Shepard the Shepard design as a uh, potential investment target for both groups. And uh, because in a sense, Elon has the same challenge if he's going to take Starship to Mars, he still needs to load a huge amount of resource uh, into fuel Starships. He needs to be able to refuel. He needs to be able to support people for years. Uh, so he gets the very, very low cost heavy lift capability, it's still sunk costs and risk. Uh, same thing uh, with Jeff Bezos. So Jeff Bezos is less interested in Mars. He more is a follower of Gerard O'Neill, whose vision in the 1970s was to create uh, uh, megastructures in space, space habitats uh, that would be what O'Neill felt was a better way to expand human civilization. O'Neill's intuition was that there was uh, great difficulties with trying to settle the surfaces of moons and of Mars because you were at the bottom of a gravity well, you have dangerous conditions both on moon, moon and Mars. It doesn't buy you a whole lot. Uh, whereas O'Neill's idea was that megastructures are, we're good as a species at building them. We build cruise ships, we build huge uh, skyscrapers and live in them, we build shopping malls and we can control our environment, manage energy, produce food, and that we can bring Earth-like environments to space-borne megastructures much more effectively than uh, we can at attempting to put hardware on a place like we shown behind me here uh, with all the risks that we saw in the Martian. Uh, so those are two different philosophical directions, but the Shepard design supports either because what you have is whizzing around the solar system you know, untold tonnage of, of material that can be converted chemically into fuels, drinking water, gases, foodstuffs, metal, and parts. And so regardless of what your strategy is, uh, if you want to send a large starship to Mars and land a lot of hardware there, uh, this is going to lower costs and, and decrease risk or de-risk a, a lot of those missions and let Jeff Bezos create 
his megastructures. I don't think that he can effectively mine the moon and do that. Um, so I think that the, the Shepard idea of going to asteroids, uh, which is the materials we saw in these slides, that material and that organic uh, load in uh, early uh, solar system asteroids possibly gave life its start in the first place and some of its water. And so that is the material that gave rise to us potentially. So that's actually where we need to go back to look for sustainable space flight, no matter what the, uh, uh, what the target is. And I'll stop there. Okay, I see a raised hand from Melissa Demma. Can I mute you? Hi, good evening, everyone. And thanks for another good and, inform and, and formal and um, uh, I feel so privileged just to be a part of this meeting. And when I got the invite, I got to say first, thank you so much again. Um, it was uh, definitely brings me out of the downtown COVID-19 blues. <laughs> then I would like to know, this might be a far out or out of sight question. But um, so where do I sign up if I wanted to uh, go on a one way trip in about 10 years? <laughs> and is that is that a real is it a reality? And you know, just if if I can't come back, and I don't want to, and is that a reality? Alex, you're probably the uh, one in the room likely to be able to make this trip. You have a comment on that? <laughs> uh, well, personally, if I were going to go, I, I, I'd like the return ticket as well. Yeah, <laughs> um, but um, if you look at Mars plans, there's kind of a dark joke that missions to Mars are always 20 years away. Right. Um, but I think if you look at both the government side from NASA and its international partners, and uh, then the industry side with uh, companies like SpaceX. Um, you're, uh, we're really starting to make progress on the technologies and the capabilities that we need to send people. And if you, um, and probably as far as a one-way uh, ticket goes and true colonization of Mars, not just exploration, creating a civilization on the planet, um, that's one of, uh, that, that's actually one of Elon Musk's primary goals for SpaceX. Uh, he wants a city of a million people on the sur surface of Mars uh, within about 50 years ago, which is an audacious goal, but um, I think that we're a species of explorers and that's something that we should try to do. So. I mean, who knows, the first of those uh, colonization missions might be le uh, leaving 10 or 20 years from now. Um, and um, and there might, uh, there's no sign up open yet, but um, uh, maybe that uh, maybe that'll start within the next few years. Okay, I'll look into it then. <laughs> um, next uh, question, I know Don, I think Don Scott had his hand raised earlier, probably didn't want to hold it up the whole time. Uh, is Don in the queue? Oh, no, I didn't have him in the queue. Must have been a physical hand. Sorry about that, but you can go next. Okay. Oh. Unmuted. Okay. You know, I just had not to change the subject too much, and, and and this has been great. You know, it's like when you're a kid and you're going to go to Disneyland and you plan in advance, and as you get closer to the trip, you get more and more and more excited. And and uh, so I tell you what, Bruce, I will be there at four in the morning or whatever god awful time you have to get up. This has been like uh, getting ready for for what's supposed to happen on the thirtieth. Hopefully, it will. But I had a question. Uh, about uh, someone, I think it was you, Bruce, that mentioned contact. Contact's a conference which brings a lot of these issues up, and many Mars people go there, and also film people like Howard heard there. And uh, so there's a lot of uh, blue sky thinking, but it's very solidly based. So Bruce is the hot spring guy. That's the way I always think of him as the hot springs guy. And Penny Boston is the cave lady. 
And I'm, I sent an email to Bruce earlier wondering if there's if there would be merit to joining those two areas of research. We know we're learning more and more about caves on Mars. We have some evidence that there were hot springs on Mars. And if, you know, it, it's just uh, common sense, which is not always a good thing to follow, indicates that caves might be a protected environment. And if there were hot springs on Mars, there might still be some in caves. And my question that I sent to Bruce earlier was, Simply, um, has anyone thought about joint research looking at the uh, possible interdisciplinary study of hot springs in caves on Mars? That's the question. Yeah, thanks, Don. There, there's been some discussion at the astrobiology science meetings about caves as environments, and, and NASA's actually funded some cave exploring robots just sort of preliminarily. Uh, my feeling is sure. I mean, Penny, uh, they go into these caves and I think Penny maybe of the, the not the discoverer, but the, the, the she named a microbial community called a snotite or snot. Yeah. These terrible things that are coming down that look like something from aliens uh, in these caves deep down the high temperature caves, et cetera, et cetera. And she's an amazing person. They found an entire microbiota in, in caves as deep as you can go. Drilling has identified microbial communities as far as five kilometers down in the Earth's crust, which is where you would presumably have to go, you'd have to go subsurface on Mars to find any evidence of living microorganisms. So the, the question might be then, if the, if the cave is exposed to the uh, to the surface, then it'll have a very, very thin atmosphere and probably unable to maintain liquid water. But if it's a completely enclosed environment, uh, it might have a different atmosphere, uh, different moistures, setting different temperatures, and we find a, a rich snotite uh, growing there. Uh, the, the challenge, of course, that being uh, is to get to a, a, a completely rock-enclosed uh, air cavity, uh, but certainly it's plausible. And uh, here's a question to follow on, uh, maybe proposal. Could a uh, four billion year old uh, moist rock cavity, of, could be quite large. I mean, these things could be miles in, in length, that is stable in Mars's uh, stagnant lead geology where there isn't plate tectonics. Could such a complex of caves deep in the rock, not connected to the surface, uh, but still a greenhouse, a veritable uh, terrarium, could that have supported the evolution of com more complex forms like fungi that would otherwise be impossible on Mars because Mars can't develop surface soils. So perhaps in my earlier statement that complex life can't emerge when things are trapped in the rocks is, it could be falsified if we could find such a cave and, Reminding me of the movie Aliens again, you know, where did they, they were drilling. I think they were mining and they broke into the cave and remember the eggs that were there. Uh, so that's kind of a vision of complex life emerging where surface habitability of that, that planet and aliens seemed to be uh, utterly uninhabitable on the surface or, or it was the weather was pretty violent. But underground, you could have complex life. So Don, you brought up a very interesting possibility there. And so a quick follow-up question, Bruce. Do we have analogs on Earth where, you know, Penny goes into caves that are really hot, really hot, but I don't think that there's, that there are hot springs. It's just that there's geothermal heat. Are there any places on this planet where in caves there are active hot springs? Do we know about that? And could they be used as analogs for Mars? That I don't know. Uh, all the caves that I've seen, I mean, all the hydrothermal systems we study, there are uh, systems that have cavities. So, for example, an active uh, volcanic hydrothermal system in New Zealand, and perhaps Kitty, who's on this call, could give us an answer, certainly could have cave-like structures deeper down. But you've got a lot of flowing water through those systems, and there's a lot of dynamism, there's a lot of change all the time. So I'm thinking that the 
hydrothermally influenced rock is going to be very dynamic and perhaps you're not going to get these cathedral like these long long lived cave structures with hydrothermal activity is just going to disrupt everything and change it constantly but that there could be certainly cavities there are certainly boilers in them um, but um, yeah i mean it's uh it's it's a question for people like martin van Tranada, who's not on this uh chat who was mentioned earlier by by alex alex do you have any insights on, on this um well i was just thinking um to add on um one of the ideas that uh bruce and i discussed in our paper was this concept of hot springs as a first and last outpost for life on Mars. So um, in other words, if Bruce's scenario for an origin of life is correct, then you might have a hot spring system on Mars like the Columbia Hills or like a few other locations we've seen from orbit where life got started. And it probably wouldn't be in, uh, the hot spring wouldn't be in a cave but as Mars died, uh, as the water went away, as the atmosphere went away, your uh, microbes could retreat, uh, retreat underground into a cave system uh, or into hydrothermal plumbing or into uh, a subsurface aquifer, um, a large reservoir uh, of groundwater a few kilometers below the surface. Uh, and uh, if you did a deep drilling experiment, um, and drilled into these bodies of water, then you might still be able to find something swimming around today. Um, okay. Anything you would add to that, Bruce? Yeah, yeah, missions that are maybe slightly beyond our technical capacity now, but if Elon is able to put a large base or settlement on Mars, that's maybe one of their missions is to continue the search for, for a life. Uh, they'll have jackhammers and bulldozers, for goodness sakes. All right, well, we have a raised hand from James Rainbolt, and then after that, a few questions from Alan Lundell in the chat. So James, I'm gonna unmute you. Hi. Uh, so first, um, I don't know how long this goes, so I'll just, I want to keep it quick, um, just a quick question. Um, and thank you again, Alex and Bruce, for presenting. Um, I guess my question is, um, you had mentioned like that uh, there was that zone of where the temperature is too cold, so you can only, um, all the missions are in that 10%. Um, but I was looking, um, but I've heard that there's like ice poles on uh, like the north or whatever north is up there but yeah um, ice poles uh, so I was wondering if there was if there's any like anything you know about anything that might might like be happening up there eventually um, or if there's like if that if that roadblock of the of that of the uh, temperature is like not really feasible at this time well um the uh the constraint I mentioned for 2020 about only 10% of the plant being accessible to the rover varies per mission. Um, the only reason 2020 couldn't go to the polar regions was because NASA wanted it to last uh, a full Mars year, which means it needs to survive the winter and it needs to be close to the equator. Now Mars ha actually has a North Polar cap and a South Polar cap, just like Earth. They're a mix of water ice like we've got here and then carbon dioxide ice because the poles of Mars are so cold, carbon dioxide actually freezes out and becomes dry ice. And back in 2008, I believe, we sent a lander called Phoenix to the poles. Uh, it had a, an, a robot arm with a scoop on it and some uh, laboratory instruments. They scooped up some of this ice they analyzed it and they, um, they figured out a pretty interesting result, which is that because it's got no large moon like the Earth, Mars actually wobbles on its axis. So sometimes the poles are pointed towards Earth and sometimes like today, um, the, uh, the tilt of Mars's axis is pretty similar to ours. And 
when the pole is pointed towards Earth, you get uh, kind of temporary pulls of water uh, in the polar region, and those could have been habitable. Now, Phoenix only lasted for about six months before the winter came, and it was crushed under the weight of several feet of carbon dioxide ice condensing in the winter. And that's one of the reasons why we didn't really want to consider that for Mars 2020. Cool, thank you. It's just interesting. Thank you, guys. No problem. All right, so we have a question from Alan about if you were to speculate about the evolutionary possibilities of Mars, what might a more advanced life form look like, a la contact consortium? I'll just uh, quick, quickly take that and also point out that uh, if you look in the chat, Kitty, who I mentioned uh, from New Zealand, who we worked with in uh, Rotorua in our Origin of Life work in the hot springs there in February, she comments, she asked, asked, asked answered the question, most of the hot springs here in New Zealand, as far as I know, are in open settings. There may be some near cave settings that we haven't picked up, but could it, but would again, and couldn't be uh, deep in the cave as geothermal is an active and dynamic, and dynamic and is changing all the time. However, there are some overlapping micro, microbial taxa that can be found in both snotites and hot springs. So yeah, there seems to be, in, in some sense, if microbes are in hydrothermal systems in the plumbing, if they're in the rocks, they're certainly going to be in caves. They're going to be anywhere life uh, can get hold, and caves are a pretty rich environment. This relates to Alan Lundell's question, uh, what kind of complex life could emerge? And this is a big, this is a big one, and this will be part of the subject of my book. Uh, that I'm starting work on is how how long does the planet have to remain stable and supportive of natural selection and evolution for complex life to emerge? And Nick Lane, our colleague at University of College London, really has worked on this far more than I have. But the the chilling uh, answer to Alan's question is probably a long time because to get Microbial communities from progeno, from passively assembled protocells, may be a very, very iffy process. And one of the big themes of the book is going to be just because you have surface water and rain and hydrothermal systems under the ocean or on volcanic islands is not, you don't automatically get living microbes. That has been a presumption of people in our field that while well, they'll simply arise with these conditions present, what we're going to do in the book is we're going to drill deep into that and we're going to we're going to test that assumption it's not even a hypothesis because we're going to show the breathtakingly challenging challenging path circuitous path from a passive protocell to a cell that's able to divide itself which is a giant machine tuned machine and the only process to get it there is evolution uh, is natural selection and to show that just as complex life is a possibly extremely rare event that required just the right accidents. But one accident I can tell you about is uh, our, our colleague, Bob Hazen at the Carnegie Institution. He's written these beautiful books. Uh, one of them talks about uh, the colors of Earth's history. You have red Earth when it was a magma ball. You have gray earth when there was the initial crust you have the black earth of volcanism you have a white earth which is complete freeze over so a couple times in in the history before the rise of complex life uh, earth's temperature uh, went to a point where it was a complete ice ball and so when you have this complete ice ball all the sunlight that's coming in is hitting the ice and bouncing off so it's a con it's a constructive thing where you stay refrigerated and this happened a couple of times, and only the happenstance of volcanoes, enough active volcanism was still present on the planet to, to break through the ice and melt the ice and put a lot of CO2 back in the atmosphere to then warm the system because 
life wasn't strong enough to do that job. So these volcanoes appeared and suddenly it all melted. And it turns out that after these massive global melts, you had a huge amount of rock weathering that occurred. A huge amount of nutrient was dumped into the system. So that the life that had been trapped underneath the ice bloomed and there was probably an evolutionary jump. And supposedly there was one of these events just before the rise of complex uh, animals and plants. Uh, I think a billion years ago or something, there was one of these snowball events. There were other events. Uh, one of the, his predictions was that Earth's geology was freezing. It was the plate tectonic system, which we kind of think of as a given, uh, was slowing down and stalling out. And that instead of these plates that were moving, driven by magma plumes and li uh, lubricated by water, was slowing. It's not a given that plate tectonics keeps going. And it's not no longer happening on Mars. Mars has this stagnant lid without cracks and without moving plates. And that uh, Bob Hazen predicts that it was stalling out and then there was a, a large impactor up to 30 kilometers struck the Earth billions of years ago and restarted the conveyor. So Earth would have gone to a stagnant lid geology by two billion years ago. And could we have had complex life? We didn't have carbon cycle. We would have had have the same volcanism, the same dynamism, continents moving around. It would have just become a stagnant system, a tomb like Mars is. And, and so all these accidents, and I, I, I propose that thousands of accidents happen along the way to set up for complex life to rise, oxygenation of the atmosphere, the earlier rise of fungi that could then uh, create paleosols, soils, and that the complex life is extremely rare. So on a planet like Mars, which by 3.5 billion years ago, 3.0 billion years ago, as Alex talks about, uh, it's losing its liquid water. If you have an extent microbiota, they're starting to be limited in their range. They're, they're having their their moment where they have the last outpost, which might have been upwelling water from a volcanic spring system. Oceans are dried out. The salty lake, which Curiosity has driven across, is, is the saline uh, results of a drying out uh, hydrosphere. And so you end up with a dying planet. So in, in that condition, are you ever going to go to complex life? It, it may be that you need a biodynamic world made up of microbes for billions of years with the right shocks, with the right accidents, the happy combination of two microbes to create the symbiotic, eukaryotic, bigger cell with organelles. You need to have that accident happen, all that molecular machinery arise uh, to get to complex life. And then you need the right oxygen, not just whiffs, but you need the pollution of oxygen in, in the atmosphere to allow metabolism and energy capture using ox oxygen, free oxygen, which is not a given and can take billions of years to, to get to that concentration. So a, a dying planet, a planet losing habitability, I don't think, basically the life forms are just adapting to the conditions that they can. There isn't really in, in a way for life to explore new and exotic patterns when you're when you're losing your habitability. So that perhaps, and this was a comment brought up at the beginning of uh, tonight's session, was most life in the in the universe is trapped, is trapped microbial communities on worlds that do not permit them to evolve further. They're they're trapped in time and they may continue to evolve. Of course they will, but to get to complex life uh, may be uh, an impossibility for, the, for those worlds. And, and we will know this if in 10 years, 20 years, uh, we drill into the surface. This is a question that came up on uh, Alan's uh, radio show on the, and Sun's radio show, the Dr. Future show today, which is uh, what happens if you do find life? So Chris McKay, uh, who works in the planetary science community at NASA, has this wonderful chart, which he shows if we drill and we find a microbiome and we sequence it, you know, we send the samples back to Earth, we sequence it, and we find that, hey, it's a match for our microbiota. 
up to a certain point, but there's an overlap, we'll know that there was a single origin somewhere. It could have been on Mars, delivered to Earth later, it could have been on Earth, even delivered back to Mars. Uh, if we find a radically different genome, a radically different mapping between information and function in, in the genetic code, we know that there were two separate starts to life, utterly separate that didn't mix, most likely, and that that tells us that life can emerge uh, in more than one place, microbial life, and it, it will be a huge revelation for us, but we would never find uh, won't find a, anything complex on Mars. It's unlikely. Uh, because of Mars, we now know Mars is a really history and we know what it takes to get complexity on a planet like ours. Uh, Venus, and people have talked about, well, could there be microbes in Venus's atmosphere? And that's a possibility because it's not 900, 600, 900 degrees on the surface. It's cooler than that temperature in the atmosphere and droplets, uh, vapor, water vapor, might be able to find microbes that once were on the surface of Venus, and that's a very challenging mission to do. Uh, of course, Alex also mentioned the, the ocean worlds, uh, the moons of Saturn and Titan, and our colleague uh, Carolyn Porco has been, was on the, uh, the Saturn, uh, the Cassini mission, which is so successful, has been hosting meetings uh, on a mission to fly through the plumes coming off the pole of Enceladus, which Cassini did, and a detected compound suggestive of organic compounds in the ocean below the ice shell. Uh, if they were driven by hydrothermal activity at the water rock interface at, at Enceladus is, uh, uh, in the core, if the core is stretching enough and has enough heat, could that be driving a living system? Would that provide enough energy flux for a living system? So could we pick up, in a new mission, could we pick up uh, more of those ices that are coming off those plumes and detect uh, clear evidence that there's life deep down in that ocean? And, and this is why I think I agree with Alex. This is, uh, when you look back from 500 years in the future, uh, as we do when we look back in, uh, to the 1400s in Europe. And there were plagues, and there were terrible behavior by leadership. There was all this nonsense going on. And if you read the detailed news of the time of the 1490s or whatever, you would lose hope for humanity. But then there was this age of exploration started 500 years ago where humanity not only found itself, it created a global civilization uh, and these great sailing ships and the technologies to navigate and map stars and map longitude and latitude. And, and it was 500 years ago, and people don't remember the miscreants of the time of the 1450s or 1490s. They remember the great things. And I think in 500 years, if we're still here, looking back, we'll remember a vehicle like this one and conversations like we're having now and a great discovery in the 21st century of life emerging elsewhere or uh, perhaps uh, for our origin of life, we'll, we'll see a progenote under a microscope that is on a, uh, a camera timer that we're going through wet dry cycling and, and stresses and we'll see that progenote, we'll see that mass of protocells growing. And then the research team that's doing this, making this movie, this time-lapse movie, will stress the environment, see the progenote shrink, begin, responding to stress and then respond by growing again, and then they'll sequence, they'll, they'll take a sample of that aggregate, not alive yet, but subject to growth and evolution and selection, and they'll find a small template that emerged spontaneously that responded to the stress they put it under, that created a little functional peptide or something that made the system more robust. And that alone, that experiment alone will show us visually how life can start a system that isn't alive, but developed in, in a cycling manner, the ability to grow and use resources and get more protocells, and then responded to stress and then regrew and then made something, that something molecular was innovated, all de novo, without somebody making it in the laboratory, something new. And that will be contact, that will be a form of contact 
as we talked about, the, the contact organization will be a form of contact that we do through our science. And we say, when we look at that, it's, it's as powerful as the image of the Earth from space shot by Apollo 17 crew. We will see, this is a, a possible scenario of how we were all made. And we've just done it in the laboratory, reproduced it in the laboratory. It's not the scenario because we can never reproduce all the conditions and lifetime of a graduate student or anybody, but that will be powerful that we now see the process that can lift life from non-life. And we've been to a world where it could have undergone that process and our world did undergo that process. And so that's sort of my uh, concluding remarks. Uh, I think we're past, uh, we're past two hours here, but uh, Chen Chen, was, has, is there anyone else uh, who has really been waving like crazy who wants to ask a final question? No one else waving that I can see. Um, we have a follow-up question, it looks like from Alan, about couldn't we help accelerate the evolutionary process for evolving life on Mars? I, I think that, yeah, in fact, uh, Alan's sitting right next to me. He could simply yeah. ask the question. Uh, Alan, why don't you come back on camera? Yeah, yeah I'll come over here because uh, I have no audio on the other I was thinking for a second. Hi, <laughs> Alan. Um, we could could we um, create uh, the a terraform Mars, if you will, to support mm -hmm. maybe maybe not us. It should take a long time to do that, but uh, to terraform Mars to support uh, microbial life. Yeah, now that's a so we're stepping into the realm of science fiction. I know at Contact we had a. Uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, uh, sort of a member of Contact, and he was our keynote speaker. Uh, he's done the best job, I think. He he wrote books on Mars, and he's read Blue Mars, Red Mars, Green Mars, uh, all about colonization. Beautifully done. He thinks uh, publicly he's stated that he thinks Elon Musk's approach is not realistic because it belies a real knowledge of the the challenges of of working on Mars. But that said, certainly um, you, my earlier comment that if you took your kombucha, you're a, a human crew and you're just about to leave and said, doggone it, you know, we got our samples and everything, but we want to leave some earth life here. So you dumped your kombucha out onto the Mars surface. No organism would survive. So, uh, and we know that on the outside of everything from Viking to a curiosity, if there's microbial films there, they've long been irradiated into little bits and pieces. But in the interior of the rover, under the belly pan, for sure there's clean room adapted bacteria, bacterial films that are in there. So in a sense, if you're reporting to big guy, a big mama guy, you could say, hey, we did get life to Mars. It's just desiccated uh, inside these vehicles for periods of time, I think gradually uh, the radiation would get it. Uh, so if you land it on the Mars uh, polar ice cap, perhaps, so perhaps uh, could you find ice living bacteria? And where I grew up in Canada, we had these pink snow sometimes, and that was, uh, that was our algae. Uh, I think uh, Don may have seen those on some of his mountain trips too, but we would see kind of these ice living uh, microbes and algaes. For my money, when I was a kid, I thought that's how we would terraform Mars. We would go to the margins of the ice cap, not terraform, but introduce Terran biology. Now, of course, NASA has an entire planetary protection program so that we don't do that and contaminate the sample, and so we'll never be able to answer Chris McKay's question. Uh, but I, I'm personally not really at all in favor of attempting to uh, attempting to put a human presence on Mars for the long term, a million person city, you're dealing with an environment that is so lethal. Uh, if you look at some of the critiques of Elon's million person city by people in the know, you'll, you'll read a much better argument than mine. But you know, you, when Matt Damon was in his flimsy structures uh, at earth pressure, you know, growing his potatoes, all he had was a layer of plastic. You know, that is not going to hold up when 
you're at 100 times pressure in that plastic Burning Man type cam uh, versus the vicissitudes of a, a hundredth of the pressure on the outside, huge temperature fl uh, fluctuation, radiation that's not going to protect Matt Damon for long, uh, and the dust, which is going to kill all the equipment and the seals and everything. Not even underground? So yeah, you have to dig. Yeah. So, uh, but then digging, it's it's a catch-22. Trying to dig uh, in the Martian regolith is as challenging as in the lunar regolith. It, yeah, finding a cave, just the right cave that you can seal uh, because you have to build a pressurize. So all of these are catch-22s. And years ago, I worked with Raytheon and NASA headquarters to develop a uh, scenario by which you would land robotics on the moon, dig caves out using telerobotics, using remote control vehicles, because you can't have astronauts using them because they're going to be dead. You know, with the equipment failing and the temperature, and you just don't want to put people on the moon before you have a habitable environment for them. But if you put equipment that's robotically driven or joystick driven, it's going to break. Uh, whenever I show would show our designs to my brother, who works in a mine and uh, operates a haul truck and the big uh, digging uh, shovels, he would just laugh. He would say, "You guys have no idea about hard rock mining, digging." equipment, those things are, we have to replace those teeth every day. And you're talking about operating at these temperatures from 275 degrees, when are you going to operate? The lunar night? You're going to, all your equipment's going to be destroyed in one mission, which is of course what happened to Chang'e, uh, the Chinese lander, and what ultimately happened to Lunokhod, the Soviet, the Soviet rover. So I think we're fooling ourselves by producing these really nice cartoon images of, of beautifully done lunar bases or Mars bases. We're just fooling ourselves. Mm. Uh, it's just so difficult. These environments are so difficult. And you know, the way to, to show that is to uh, build an environment on Earth, build a vacuum chamber, highly irradiated, same thing, and just try to do it on Earth. Try to, we can, we can falsify our hypothesis or look, at least look at our costs. So this is why Jeff Bezos has really focused on the megastructures, um, hearing Gerard O'Neill's arguments in the 70s. What's your thoughts on Elon's ideas of uh, nuking the poles to melt uh, the, the poles to create an atmosphere for Mars? Well, there have been other ideas in sci-fi of dropping comet nuclei. Now, nuking the poles, you'd have to get somebody's approval from somewhere. I, I think I think that sounds like a desperate solution. That's not a an elegant solution with predictable results. Uh, Mars is a sink. Mars became a sink for liquid water. It became a sink for volatiles a long time ago. And Mars's surface is ancient. It's a it's a preserved, desiccated mummy, basically, of a planet. That that's why we can look down and see these ancient landscapes un, unchanged because there's been no, not the same weathering or plate tectonics we have. So Mars is a sink. And why would you want to sink? If you dropped a large comet head uh, on Mars and created a temporary vapor environment, temporary uh, precipitative environment, it would be gone very quickly because the, the sink is so large. Uh, and the moon is impossible. I mean, in, in the vacuum setting and with those temperature fluctuations, the moon truly is a harsh mistress. So I tend to swing toward Blue Origin and Jeff Bezos' vision as being practical because this is what humans do. We, humans, you know, even when we were in caves, we were building controlled environments. We still prefer to live indoors, not outdoors. And it's been our whole trend as a species that we've become really good at fabricating uh, structures to live in and uh, rather than you know it's sort of saying like well do you want to stay on the cruise ship or, or go off onto the Antarctic ice sheet or into the Sahara you no know, no people are going to live in that they're going to live in that environment of the of the cruise ship and they're going to visit the harsh environments that can't sustain life they're not going to attempt to make a large settlement they're going to prefer the cruise ship so I mean, this is a, a great theme for when contact meets again. Uh, as a shout out, contact-conference.com uh, is where we all developed a lot of these ideas since the early 80s, and I started going in the mid-90s. Um, 
it's a shout out for a great meeting uh, that we hope will return um, perhaps online maybe don can can convince the powers that be we can do contact in zoom uh, and and with that um, i think we're definitely over time we, we 28 souls have stayed with us amazingly for this whole time i'm super pleased with support by alex couldn't have done without you shen shen also great hosting and why don't we just uh open all the mics as we do in our tradition here to let everybody just get over a little social distance and come together thanks bruce <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Love this. Thanks, so great. Thank you. Chris, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Smile, Chris. <laughs> Good night. See you at 4 30 a.m. on Thursday. Yeah. Oh. Join the launch party. <laughs> <laughs> Where do we watch that? Oh my, Where do you my mic. I don't think it can pick me up. <laughs> and we'll have we'll we'll have this recording up at some, in some form. Maybe Alan can do as a great editing job like he's done, or uh, or to Aaron or somebody. Yeah. I will definitely do it. I'll be up. You know I will be. Okay, who's playing the harmonica? Then? Yeah. <laughs> Create some harmony on this earth. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we do need that. That's me, Greg Panos. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how wonderful. Blessings to everyone and enjoy your week. We'll probably have another one of these toward the end of, well, maybe we'll do a Burning Man themed one uh, at the end of August. What do you think? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. End of August, we a Burning Man themed one. That was great. <laughs> All, all of the future is going to come from Burning Man in some form. Yep. What was inspiring about it, mostly? There's a big Burning Man VR thing that's happening this year. I think anybody can hear me? Yeah, we can hear me. All right, everyone. Blessings. Charles, I'll talk to you soon. Aaron, hopefully, too. Howard, good to hear from you. Yes, I'll have to keep in touch better. <laughs> yeah, we've all been pretty disrupted uh, in the last six months. I know, but I have never stopped thinking about filmmaking with you, though, at any point. Never stopped thinking about it. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, I think we're ready for something new kind Good. of show. Yeah. It's the thought that counts. Well, it yeah. will be, but then we can, we can do stuff, too. <laughs> Deliverables matter, too. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> Charles meet Howard. Howard meet Charles. Hi. Hey, 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 Howard. That's right. Charles Bruce has mentioned you before. I do recall that. <laughs> well, we're all thinking about, you know, not how to influence 2020. That's a fool's game, but how to yeah. influence the decade of the 2020s. And there's a mm -hmm. lot within this, you know, um, constellation of ideas that has a great deal of value to inspire the next decade. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I vote for the future every time. <laughs> It's foolish to vote against it, which is what we seem to be doing as a society right now. But I think yeah. we'll, we'll find a way, you know, back to making the correct bet sooner than later. Yeah, absolutely. And Larry, I hope to see your sketches sometime. <laughs> Larry's always doing live sketches during the uh, salons. I will send cool. them to you as soon as I scan them. I got some, some pretty good ones tonight. <laughs> Another levity tradition is Larry's sketches. <laughs> All right. Marcos, I'd love to hear what you're up to at UCSB at some point. I think yeah, I visited. We should catch up. We should catch up. Uh, I was just too busy listening this time, but uh, yeah. Uh, there's something to do with Mars, too. Um, cool. Yeah, I'll tell you about it. Bruce so, at Damer.com. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for doing this, Bruce, and great. And uh, Alex, really great presentation. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah those were fabulous. fabulous. Thank you. Yeah, well done, it's Alex. Intelligent. What's it, people? Hmm? Definitely. Thanks to the futures for hosting. The presentations were great. Really were. Yeah. All right, Alex. We'll be in touch. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Bruce.
So long. Cheerio. Yeah. Take care. See you guys. Thank you.